You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind, episode number 10. You're only given a little spark of madness. You mustn't lose it. Robin Williams. Have you ever wondered what it's like inside a screenwriter's mind? In this podcast, we explore how successful screenwriters tackle structure, plot, character, dialogue, and the film business. Get ready to go down the rabbit hole of story. Let's travel inside the screenwriter's mind with your guide, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Screenwriter's Mind. I am your guide, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters. All you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Now guys, today we go inside the mind of screenwriter Paul Castro, who wrote one of my favorite films, of the early 2000s, August Rush, starring Robin Williams and Carrie Russell. And Paul has also been an instructor of screenwriting for many, many years, and this interview was amazing. Now, this episode was originally aired on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, so prepare yourself to go inside the mind of screenwriter Paul Castro. Paul, man, thank you for taking the time out. I really appreciate it, man. Sure, Alex. Absolutely. I'm happy to do it. So um, I want to jump in right into it. So uh, how did you get your foot in Hollywood's door, which is a screenwriter's, I think one of the ultimate questions for all screenwriters, like, how do you break through? There's so much noise. There's so many people trying to do it. How did you get your foot in the door? Yeah, it's uh, a valid question and one that is asked uh, perpetually throughout the years by uh, up and coming screenwriters and even my uh, friends who have uh, also taken similar paths. Um, I was on the East Coast and I was in a suit and tie job out of college in the Washington, D.C. area, and it wasn't terribly pleasant. And I made the decision to go to Hollywood in the attempt of trading daydreams for dollars as a professional screenwriter. Um, And I thought UCLA film school would be the best path being that the majority of Oscar winners have come out of that program. So I Mm -hmm. thought that would be a good start. So I drove cross country in my truck and I was excited to go to UCLA. There was only one challenge, Alex. <laughs> Which is I got rejected. <laughs> of course. You already packed up, you bought the you bought the t-shirt, you bought the hat, the mug. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, everything. And um so I uh you know, I I contacted uh or attempted to contact the chair of the department um to no avail. So I went to UCLA and I put in the mailboxes of every film professor the top 10 reasons why they should reconsider my application. And I just, you know, printed it out and put it in their mailbox in hopes of some type of response. Fortunately, the chairperson of the department called me up and said, oh, we got your uh, top 10 list. It was very (laughs) funny. Made us all laugh. And I said, well, great. Am I in? And he said, no, absolutely not. (laughs) But thank you for the hustle. I appreciate yeah, it. Exactly. So a year later, I did apply again. And fortunately, I was one of the 18 to get in. Um, and it was it was a good year. I, I was glad looking back on it that I didn't get in because it gave me a chance to really hone my craft and 
you know, write and take seminars and read books and uh, do everything I could uh, humanly possible to um, inculcate myself into the system in an organic, holistic way. So no. at UCLA, we had to write a full-length feature, uh, feature-length screenplay, Alex, every eight weeks for three years. Jesus. Yeah. That's insane. Like, it took me forever to write my first feature script. Yeah, right? <laughs> Holy it's, cow. It's so, and, and those who, could, who couldn't keep up were invited to leave the program. So I felt, wow, i got to get this done. So, um, yeah, with so I got really lucky because um, of that pressure because I had to come up with ideas. Of and course. I, I have a nephew named – Anthony, and he at the time was five years old. He was like a, a redheaded Harry Potter type kid, right? <laughs> right. And uh, he, he was born on August 5th. And he kept looking off into space and kind of pondering life a lot. And I said, hey, what's going on? What are you thinking about, little guy? And he would say, well, do you hear the train in, in the distance? Yeah. Do you hear the, the kids playing soccer? Yeah. Do you hear the birds chirping? I go, yeah. He goes, put it all together. It's music. And I went, whoa, okay, that's trippy, right? So it just kind of stayed with me. It resonated with me. And um, when it was time to come up with another idea for UCLA, um, I thought, huh, what if this kid had like this amazing musical ability simply because he could take sounds from everyday life? So I wrote a screenplay called Noise, and Noise was about a young musical prodigy named August Rush who uses his gifts to reunite his estranged parents. And I came up with the name August Rush because Anthony was born August 5th, and Jeffrey Rush won the Oscar for a movie called Shine. Yeah, yeah. He made that movie. That's an awesome movie. Yeah, it was a musical movie, so I thought, oh, okay, that makes sense. So <laughs> – yeah, so it was just one of those things. Okay, here goes another screenplay. And um, the chairperson of the screenwriting department at UCLA, uh, Richard Walter, who to this day is a dear friend and mentor and wonderful person. Um, so Richard said, hey, I really love this screenplay. May I give it to a producer friend of mine? And I said, absolutely not. No, of course I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. No, no, no. Please, please don't do that. Yeah, no, please. I want to. I want to marinate in angst and uh, <laughs> work at Starbucks for, for the rest of my life. Uh, Not that there's anything wrong with Starbucks. You know what? <laughs> Starbucks is part of my daily ritual, and there are many days when I go, man, I just wish I could just chill here and meet people all day and work at Starbucks. How much? How many screenwriters are at Starbucks on a daily basis here in Los Angeles? <laughs> and the best ones are the ones that work there, probably. You right? know, the funniest thing is. Is that and this is hard for people outside of LA to understand is when you walk into a Starbucks, any Starbucks in the Los Angeles area, yeah. you will see a laptop with Final Draft open. It, it just <laughs> I've not yet found one that it, it's always somebody working on a screenplay, or if not, you will hear someone talking about the story that they're gonna write. You know what? You know you're <laughs> right. You, you know. Uh, if you get pulled over by a cop for not wearing your seatbelt, you could always ask him, hey, how's your screenplay going? He's going to go, oh, how did you know? It's great. <laughs> Welcome to L.A., Holly Weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that, that was the situation and it was you know serendipity, cosmic choreography, a, a, a plethora of luck. Mm -hmm. And so I met with this producer and he really liked the screenplay. He also liked something else I wrote called A Gift for Mom. And I was fortunate. He gave me a three-picture deal. Um, oh, wow. And it was pretty substantial. But, it, you know, I mean, just one of those things. It was just very lucky. There are screenwriters I meet on a daily basis that are enormously talented that have still not, uh, you know, I, I hesitate Correct. to say made it because what is that really? As long as you're being creative and contributing to uh, the world in some way, shape, or form with your creativity. I think that's success. But, right. um, but yeah. being able to make a living doing what you love to do is the, yeah, dr is the yeah. dream. And, when we, and that dream is varied for very like, – you don't have to be a billionaire. You can you – know, and that's something we preach at Indie Film also is like you know, what, what is success to you guys? Like is 100 grand a year doing what you love? Is that enough? 
Mm-hmm. Is 50 grand a year, you know, living in Kansas, is that enough? You know, like, yeah, that's the question you have to ask yourself. But anyway, sorry, I, I digress. Yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. That, that is uh, a, a wonderful way to approach it. You know, what is your definition of success? First of all, what is that? You know, um, so that's that's how I got started. I got very lucky. Um, you were at the right place at the right time with the right project. Yeah, exactly. And I guess. You know, I mean, I, I definitely don't want to project false humility, but mm-hmm. there is a lot of luck to it. But I also do have to say I wrote a lot. Um, by that time when I sold August Rush, I had written probably 11 feature film mm-hmm. screenplays, maybe 12. That's a number. That's the, I, I've interviewed a bunch of different uh, screenwriters, and the number is 10, 11, 12 before something gets sold. Is that's yeah. a that's a good number. I mean, there are the the oddballs that sell it like their first script, their second script, or something like that. But generally, you have to kind of like get all the bad scripts out. <laughs> they say, say, yeah, get yeah. all the bad writing done early, right? And I think you already know my philosophy. Um, it's not right about what you know; it's right about what you know hurts. Mm-hmm. You know, um, everyone has their little owies from life, something that's mm-hmm. happened to them. Um, usually it's from childhood that has stayed with them. And the writers who are brave enough to go into the belly of the beast of that situation early on, um, you don't have to write the, the 9, 10, 11, 12 scripts. They can actually nail it on the first or second or third time. Right. Um, and uh, and you don't have to write about that situation, Alex, as you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. It, it's writing about that emotion. So what is that emotion that – okay, so when the wave retracts of something that was horrifying or embarrassing or shameful to you, mm-hmm. when that wave retracts, what are the uh, seashell gems left behind? What is that emotion? And that's the, that's where some of the best writing has come from uh, in a lot of ways, especially when you're starting out, I'd imagine – I mean, I've heard from many different. I mean, I've read every screenwriting book and everything, and yeah. a lot, and and a lot of a lot of the gurus and a lot of successful screenwriters as well always say, um, you know, at the beginning you write what you know or that pain that you're saying about. Then later on, as you become better with your craft, you can start creating the Harry Potters of the world and things that aren't based in reality. Is that something that you agree with, or what's your point of view on that? No. I – Again, I, I would suggest never second guessing the market and what uh, the market wants and what could sell or should sell. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at something like uh, Aaron Brockovich, okay? Right. Would that have ever sold now? But Julia Roberts said, hey, this rocks. And then you have a movie. And Steven know? Soderbergh was like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like that everything came together. Right. So I'm a big believer, Alex, in. You know, give yourself to the world and come from the spirit of contribution. Yeah, and yeah. the universe will conspire on your behalf. That's a great. That's excellent. That really is excellent. That's a great. That's great advice. Um, now, with August Rush, I've always wanted to ask a screenwriter this story. How was the process of getting a story? You've got, you've got it sold now. What is the process of the journey that it went through to get it onto the screen? So like how did the development process go? I mean, you don't have to, I mean, I know this is a very long question, but just, you know, as you know, just give us a, a, a reader digest version of it. Like how, what was the journey like for August Rush to get it out to the big screen? Cause it was released by obviously a major studio with major stars in it. Um, so it's not a slight little indie film. It was a, it was a big studio movie at the time. So how, sure. how was that process? Yeah. Um, well, it was a, it was an involved process, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. And actually, now it's another process because August Rush is going to Broadway. Oh, how so, awesome is that! Congratulations! Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, I'm excited because I think it will translate well to the stage. So, yeah, so the Writers Guild only requires you know two rewrites and a polish at the time when I sold it. Um, but I was a, a young new writer, eager to please. So I was in writer. Uh, rewrite. And some people would say hell, but I don't think it was. I think it was uh, a wonderful training ground for me. Mm -hmm. So over a two year period, I did, I don't know, 16, 17 drafts of that script. (laughs) I'm serious. How many years? Yeah. Two and a two, two and a half years. Jesus. So you're basically in development as they call it development hell. 
Well, yeah, in, yeah, in a sense, I never want to. I never want to use negative connotative <laughs> words. Sure. Fair <laughs> enough. Know? Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was challenging, and it trained me well for my future in Hollywood. Okay. Um, and I often uh, joke, you know, something really tragic happened in that process. It got better. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sad. Amazingly enough, right? Yeah, because sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't, but but it did. And um, and then after about two two and a half years, my agent, manager, lawyer, business manager, they had an intervention and said, "If you keep rewriting for this project, we're going to resign because it's ludicrous." <laughs> and yeah, you had so an I, intervention. That's brilliant. Yeah. Well, that's how I looked at it because yeah. they sat me down and said, "Enough is enough." Yeah. Um, so I went on, you know, and I was doing other projects at the time. Um, right. I did, uh, you know, I had the f- good fortune of working with Stan Lee, uh, you know, founder of Marvel Entertainment on two projects. And, you know, I had other things going on, um, but I really loved August Rush and I, of course, hoped it would get made someday. So a couple of years went by and came really close to getting made, um, different directors attached and reading it and liking it. And then the producer did a movie with Robin Williams and said, hey, can you take a look at this script? And Robin read it and said, yeah, but my part has to be more substantial. I believe that's how it went down. Mm -hmm. And so the producer wisely hired um, two writers and they gave it another polish and pass and rewrite. And then about a year and a half later – Um, I believe Robin officially became attached to the project. And when Robin Williams is attached to a project, you know, that's good news for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So fortunately, then things were off to the races. And then Freddie Highmore and Carrie Russell and Johnny Myers. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it became a a real thing. So the second that Robin got attached, everything kind of opened. The doors, the floodgates kind of opened up and everything got speech, got, got hyped up a bit. As far as the speed is concerned. Exactly. Everything was coalesced and uh, off to the races. The funny thing is I had an opportunity to meet Robin once. uh, Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I've never met a human being. And he was so calm and very, you know, he was not the the person, the persona he portrays. You know, he was that kind of energetic guy. But he, that day he was very calm with his wife. Mm -hmm. And, but you could feel the energy coming off of him. It was something that was tangible in the air like you could sense and i don't want to get into all the kind of like you know uh vibey stuff but it literally you can sense the vibe of the man it was i never met a human being like that before but i got it yeah. i got it you're 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 on to something and i don't mind you getting into the vibey stuff <laughs> <laughs> i mean no no i know vibey stuff right? it everyone, is everyone has energy and and uh, and we, what is your energy and are you are you comfortable with it do you like it do you like what you're projecting to the world is it uh, enhancing your life are you empowering yes. people or depleting people are they empowering you or depleting you it all starts with energy and that's yeah. what resonates from a great script it just is vibrating the same way you just described yeah and that, great robin williams yeah he was he was amazing um and one uh, w- one quick note i actually was watching i think a documentary or something on the matrix uh the matrix boys uh okay. or boy and girl um and they they that was in development hell forever because it was mm-hmm. forever and it took him they they rewrote it you were saying you rewrote it rewrote it they rewrote that for five years mm. five years oh. and that's why that script is that movie is so good that's amazing <laughs> yeah that's amazing. but to your point like you know sometimes the rewriting process is helpful <laughs> Yeah, you know, something takes over. If you surrender to it and you're not kicking and screaming, um, right, you know, right. we're all very precious with our work sometimes. And, you know, I would encourage the opposite, you know, when you uh, just allow it to flow naturally, organically, and take input and, you know, take it and you don't have to always use it. You can go, huh, that's interesting. Maybe for my next script, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a lot of, a lot of working with or collaborating with people. A lot of times in Hollywood, from my understanding is that, 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 that kind of mentality works really well, kind of going with the flow, kind of like, you know, just kind of riding the waves because if you try to go against the flow is when you have problems. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, on the same note, we all as 
creatives need to have a strong, clear vision for mm-hmm. what we want to communicate creatively. And, you know, we're not typists. We get paid for our point of view of the world. And I really believe that's why new writers and old writers, veteran writers, um, can all be successful because everyone has a different point of view of the world, Alex, right? Yep, so yep. you and I uh, born and raised in New York and now we're at different places. But, mm-hmm. you know, your point of view of the world is very different than mine. And I, mm-hmm. I celebrate that. And that's why we go to the movies. And that was the other, that's the other thing I, I always try to preach here as well is that – uh, filmmakers, a lot of times they're just like, oh, I'm going to be the next Tarantino. Oh, I'm going to be the next David Fincher. I'm going to try to copy this or that. And I'm like, you'll never be the next Tarantino because there's only one Tarantino and yeah. there's only one voice. You, I think only all the successful writers and filmmakers all have a very loud and distinctive style and voice. And that's what people don't get coming into the business. They all want to try to emulate the next, oh, that's big. So I'm going to do that. I'm like, well, that might, that might work once, but it won't sustain a career, you know? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, you know, when you say they all have a loud voice, sometimes the loudest voices are the subtle, uh, quiet voices that just have a big impact because of their subtlety and their nuances. Well, like Wes Anderson. I mean, he's not a very loud personality by any stretch, but his movies are, they, they scream his, his style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. And Buster, and Buster and Buster Keaton for that matter as well. I mean, he was obviously silent, but his style of his style of humor and his style of, of storytelling is something that was uh very distinctive. Yeah. Um so so let me ask you, when does a writer need an agent or a manager? Is another big question a lot of uh, screenwriters ask. Hmm. You know, it, it's a great question, and I think it goes back to the approach of contribution. Okay, Most writers, and I was there too, where you say, I need an agent, I want an agent, I need to sell something, I want an agent or a manager. And you first have to ask yourself, what do I have in my vault to contribute to this agent or manager? Yes. Yeah, yeah what a awesome. value. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Instead, of, instead of looking at an agent or a manager, it's like, what can you do for me? You should yeah. flip the script a bit, and that's awesome advice. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I, when I was in L.A., you know, you know Joe Manganiello. Uh, mm-hmm. when, he, when he was an actor running around L.A., he was also the type of guy who, hey, Joe, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I'm driving two hours to San Diego for a little play that I'm not getting paid for and driving two hours back, which, I, oh, by the way, I've been doing for the last month and a half. You know, it was right. a person who was on purpose, not paycheck, looking to contribute at a high level. And the rest of it just, you know, came like an avalanche of abundance for that guy. And it happens for most successful people if they're coming from a place of contribution. Circling back. Mm-hmm. For agents, first of all, new writers and all writers and anyone in the creative arts, especially media and entertainment, First needs to realize that agents are not scumbags. Now, <laughs> are there scumbags in every single profession on the planet? Yes. Yes. Well, except for <laughs> politics. No, obviously, obviously not <laughs> politics. Yeah. They're, they're on the up and up, of course. <laughs> yeah. But, but there's going to be that in any profession. So if you're coming to Hollywood and saying, oh, all agents are bastards, then yeah, that's going to be your experience. But mm-hmm. um, I think they're great. If you're contributing to them, they're going to be wonderful and they're going to contribute to you and they're going to enhance your career. So I would suggest having a body of work besides just one screenplay. Um, I would, you know, two, three, four, five, maybe some pilot episodes for TV. Uh, If you have some non-scripted reality show ideas, you know, sculpt that as well. Let them know that you're you're just not a one trick pony. You have you're in this for the long haul, and you have an arsenal to contribute to them and their stable. Right, that's a great, that's amazing advice, actually. Um, now, what? And this is a- I, I love that you say that's amazing advice. Actually, as if the actually part means usually your advice is terrible. But not you, actually- not you. <laughs> but as a general answer to these kind of questions, I know I'm joking. I know, people just a lot of times people are just like, oh well, you know, you got to do this and that, and it's like, okay, that's an answer, but it's not like. So what I try to do with my guests is I really try to dig for questions that I want to know answers to. So like that's a, like I've always asked them. I was like, what? 
what do I need to do to create get an agent or a manager? Yeah. Should I even need one as a director at this point in my in my life in my career? Right. And I was like, well, you have to. And that's all about what we were talking about earlier about marketing is like you as a, as a, as a creator are marketing yourself to an agent and manager and selling yourself to them to go, look, this is what I can do for you because it's already assumed that they can do something for, for the, the writer if yeah. they're choosing the proper agent or manager. Yeah, so exactly. That's a good point. And okay. So <laughs> if I said to a writer, um, would you like Aaron Sorkin's agent? They would probably say what? Uh, oh, of course. Oh, of course. Okay. But what if you don't write character-driven, talky-type movies that are very uh, deep and insightful and poignant? What if you are the popcorn summer blockbuster action-adventure guy or horror film guy? Is Aaron Sorkin's agent the right guy for you? Probably not. Maybe – down the hall, uh, his colleague, maybe she's the right agent for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe she is the one that has sold a bunch of horror films. So I think targeting the right representation is just as important as uh, if you should have representation uh, or not. Now, this is a big question. As, as, I, as I'm, I'm digging deep here, um, what is the difference between a screenplay that actually sells and one that doesn't sell? And I know that's a real broad term, so do the best you can. <laughs> it's an easy question to answer. Oh, good. You know, in Hollywood, they don't buy screenplays. They buy emotion. So if you can make a reader feel something on a very visceral level, then it cannot be ignored. Haley Fox, I always mention Haley by name, mm -hmm. because she was the development executive at the production company that bought my first screenplay. Mm -hmm. And she was so passionate about it that she says, if you don't buy this screenplay, I am going to quit. And I've been here seven years, but there's no need for me to be here. Wow. She felt that deeply about the material. Now, when writers are coming from a place of truth, facing that hurt that we talked about, that was a little always from childhood. And I say little, obviously I'm, I'm not making light of it. They're very sure. substantial. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they can take that, that hurt or that rage and put it on the page. And then eventually it makes it to the big stage of, of, you know, cinema or television. It's because somebody felt something. It's, they felt deeply about it. And um, it can't be ignored. And those are the screenplays, teleplays, pilot episodes that sell because people all have that response. Um, you, you look at Eric Roth's uh, Forrest Gump, oh. right? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, Robert Zemeckis gave it to Tom Hanks when he was going on vacation to Europe. And Tom said, yeah, I really don't want to read anything. I'm on vacation. And, and, he's, and Zemeckis said, well, just read like the first 10 pages on the flight. And by the time the flight landed, Tom Hanks was attached to Forrest Gump. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, yeah. Now, talk, yeah. talking about emotion, like there's a show I watch now on, uh, that I'm loyal to on, uh, on TV. It's called The Goldbergs. Mm -hmm. uh, and Andy, uh, Adam Goldberg is the writer and creator of that. And that's literally – He's taking his owies every week and yeah. putting them out yeah. on the screen. And but right. that authenticity, it's not like another 80s show. Oh, it's another, oh, we're all making fun of the 80s, which I I'm a huge 80s fan. Um, yeah. that's probably one of the reasons I like it so much. But the characters, the family, the and then every week at the end he shows a video when he was shot when he was a kid, or you're like, oh, this is just brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that's that kind of stuff that you're talking about that's so emotional in, in his genre. Yeah, and, and Adam's been doing this a while, right? I yeah. Mean, so, so he's finally come to the point where he's like, no, I'm going to give myself. This is the, this is the real hurt. Mm -hmm. And in real estate, the three most important things are location, location, location. And in writing, especially screenwriting, it's conflict, conflict, conflict. Yeah, and there's a lot of conflict in that, in that family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I rewrote myself, it would just be one conflict, right? Exactly, like, exactly. And economical. Um, real quick, now, I know log lines is a big, a big uh, question. A lot of times for for starting up screen, starting re screenwriters, like how important is it? How important is it in the selling process? Is it something? What, what's your experience with that? 
Yeah, I think it's really important and it's uh, overlooked and it's underrated in the process. If you cannot sculpt a vibrant, lean log line that's going to fully communicate your screenplay or your television show idea, then you're not ready to go any further. Um, it's one of the most most difficult parts of the process, Alex. It really is. Mm-hmm. I know. I've, I've I've had to write a couple that they're painful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you're gonna have to try it out with friends and families, and rewrite it, and see when they glaze over and when they get excited. And you're gonna have to keep working on it until it's really just nailed, right? And it's like every word means something like literally every single syllable means something because the real estate's so short it's almost like a twitter a tweet yeah <laughs> you have to make it really concise yeah yeah i like that the real real estate is so short that's a good way of putting it um it is and people don't have time to really you know uh, before i was even represented i would you know try to get agents on the phone and they're and one time I got Mord Viner. He was an old Hollywood agent, uh, very famous at the time. Um, and Mort uh, sadly has since passed. But it was after hours and I called, <clears throat> you know, uh, one of the big three. I think Mort was with ICM at the time. And um, his assistants were gone. So guess who answered the darn phone? Mort Viner. <laughs> and and I, oh, oh, hi, Mr. Von. All right, what you, for film student. Okay, what do you got? What do you got, kid? Yeah. And I literally had to pitch that thing and title, genre, and the pitch. And that was yeah. it. Yeah. And off of that, he wanted to read the screenplay. Um, and it wasn't because I just took it off the top of my head. Fortunately, I had heard this uh, before uh, copious times at UCLA where they hammered into us. This is very important. So I was prepared. Um, and there's been times when I've read new writers and I've, I, I read their screenplay. And I go, oh, my God, this is fantastic. And they go, well, you didn't seem very enthused when I first pitched it to you. Well, that's because your pitch was, well, it's kind of like, you know. <laughs> it's it's kind of like Forrest Gump meets Hostel, you know. It's kind <laughs> of. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's challenging when you're you're using other material to pitch your, um, your, your material, such as saying it's like this and like that. Because what if the person hasn't seen one of those or both of those? Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And. And any and any time I've uh, I've actually asked this question before on the show is like if you you know it's kind of like the Matrix meets you know Cinderella. Uh, <laughs> if, if nice. you, yeah, I, watch, I, watch. I actually would watch that movie too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But one key thing, if you are going to do that, and it is kind of like a lot of times a necessary evil to have that in your back pocket because someone's going to ask that question sometimes. Um, at least that's what I've been told. Um, make sure that you use movies that have been hits. <laughs> so it's like Ishtar meets the Fantastic Four, the new one. So it's like not really going to help you sell your product very well. Although there have been movies that were not hits that just you know people loved or got great reviews. Or correct, time yeah. came later on. So like it's a Wonderful Life, you know, yeah. the holidays are coming up, and on TV we're going to see It's a Wonderful Life as we do every year. But of when course. that first came out, it wasn't well received at all. Yeah, well, same like Shawshank Redemption picked up its steam much later on after its initial release. Yeah, and I, it's it's funny. I, titles, I, I know we're not on the title subject, sure. Alex, but yeah. I'm going to bring it up anyway. Was, titles are so important. That was the you. worst title ever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but it was from a Stephen King novella, yeah. Rita Hayworth and yeah. the Shawshank Redemption. All right. So being that it was the great Steve, you know, Stephen King, are they going to say, no, we hate your title? But that was a situation where I think if the title was a little different, it probably would have uh, had a bigger audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, it's a masterpiece. And Frank Darabont and yeah. Stephen King, I mean, wow. Yeah, I know. It's ab- absolutely. But yeah, you're right. Like that's the, one of the worst titles in history. There was a new movie that um, that just came out with the worst title um, is the Sandra Bullock movie. And Billy Bob Thornton, mm. our brand is Crisis. <laughs> I saw the poster for that. I'm like, what? Who came up with that title? It's like, I'm sure it's a fun movie, and I love Sandra Bullock. I love everybody in the in the movie, but I'm like, and it died. It died a miserable, horrible death at the box office. Yeah, and I imagine the title did not help the situation. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's that's a really important aspect of the whole process. I mean, let's t- talk about okay, if you're a parent and you have a, a newborn on the way, mm-hmm. 
uh, let's decide, you know, I don't know. Should we eat? Let's not even think about it. It doesn't really matter. Okay. No. <laughs> it's no, this is your child. You're going to put a lot of thought into what that person's name is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a, a dear friend of mine, Luke Fontenot, who's at Warner Brothers Marketing, mm-hmm. um, such a smart guy. And, and he really, uh, I really think he has the crystal ball into if a movie's going to do well or not, simply because. You can look at it from a helicopter point of view and a micro point of view and mm-hmm. all these nuances we're talking about. Titles are uh, titles are extremely important. And and I think and again it's a, it goes back to marketing and, and branding and, mm-hmm. and and a lot of screenwriters and artists in general, filmmakers don't look at their art as product. But mm-hmm. it, if you look at it as product and market it and sell it as product, even though it's art, you have so much better chance of selling it to whatever aspect you're trying to sell it to in the business. So if you're trying to sell it to an agent, sell it to a production company, sell it to an audience, sell it to the person you're just pitching it to, there's it's always about selling it and promoting it and and packaging it in a right way to get the attention or the the um, the end result that you're looking for. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's an interesting craft because it's not only a craft, it's a profession and yeah. it's, it's where art and commerce meet. And a lot of these production houses, mini majors, the big studios, the marketing department has the final word on if a, a screenplay is going to be green lit or sold mm-hmm. or bought. Um, it will go through all the proper channels. But if the marketing department goes, oh, my God, we love it, but we don't know how to market it, then guess what? It's dead. It's, do- it's done. Yeah, it's done. Yeah. Un- unless you're doing it independently and – You've got your own money, uh, and you're going to do it that route. Uh, it's yeah. it's rough, <laughs> without yeah, question. Absolutely. Now, talking about production companies, how do how does a screenwriter should a screenwriter submit their work to a producer or a company? Mm-hmm. Well, it's challenging because a lot of them don't accept uh, unsolicited material mm-hmm. uh, for for various legalities. Um, that being said, some will have open uh, processes where you have to sign certain forms, and then they'll accept it. Mm-hmm. Again, I would target a production company that does your type of material. Um, I would find a person in that production company, not just blindly send it there. Um, I would get on the phone, build a relationship with them, uh, meet them on social media. And you know, I think the best of it, approach is to ask advice. If you're a new writer in this industry, you know, uh, you don't have all the answers. And oh, by the way, I don't have all the answers. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly asking advice uh, from people. You know, I have had the good fortune of sitting down uh, for a couple of hours with Michael Eisner. I've known Michael for you know five, six years now. It's probably been like seven years now. Mm-hmm. And if, I'm always looking for advice from him, but I'm also looking, how can I add value to him? Um, right. But I'm always trying to, you know, what ne- what are your needs and how can I satiate those as a production company? What do they want to do? Do they want to make art? Do they want to win an Oscar? Do they want to make money? Of course they want to make money. And there's nothing wrong with making money. This is an industry where, you know, great, make money. You know, right. if, if Alex's screenplay gets made, it's going to employ thousands of people and there's going to be all these other ancillary business entities that are going to benefit from Alex's screenplay. It could be on uh, HBO and Showtime. It could be on an airplane going to, you know, Europe. It can be in a hotel room while, while I'm there with my, you know, whatever. And right. so, so it, it's a really interesting world in the fact that once the property is out there to the world, many people can benefit from it. And of course, when I say property, the screenplay. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I'm going to get more personal into your process. What is your process of writing a screenplay? If you don't mind us, just the, the basic, you know, A's yeah. and B's. What do you, what's your process of go? Because I always find it fascinating. Everyone approaches the craft differently. So I'd love to hear what, how you do it. Yeah. So the idea is obviously paramount. So does the idea really rock your world? Is it something that you're thinking about a lot and it's almost haunting you? And if you can, 
package it into that log line uh, package is not a good word for this but <laughs> if you can if you can create a log line where you've captured what you initially responded favorably uh, towards your idea then you're onto something so i do the log line and i i work a lot on that as far as just sculpting resculpting it you know like you said uh wisely every word counts right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and and it, even if it's the right word, is it the right word for the lyrical nature of your logline? Mm-hmm. So you have to see how it fits into the overall scheme of things as well. Loglines are generally it's an it's an art form in itself. Yeah, absolutely. And then for your audience members out there that may not know what a logline is, it's a one liner. I often say it's a one liner instead of logline because I'm not even sure where that etymology. Came. Right. <laughs> where's Where's the log and where's the line? I don't understand. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so once I have the logline, I do a two page movie, which is basically uh, two pages double spaced of if Alex and I were walking to the bus stop and. Alex says, hey, man, I got to go. Uh, what, what did you see last night? And I tell you what my movie is as we're both going in different directions. It's that fast. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just really broad strokes, but it's more involved than the log line. And then I do a uh, 30 to 60 beat outline. And But I hit some – oh, sorry. Didn't have my phone off. I hit some, <laughs> I sorry. I, can, I can't. I cannot. I cannot work like this. No, I'm joking. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm fired. Uh, right, go ahead. So, you're saying. Yeah. So so the outline hits various beats, and as you know, Alex, uh, you know the opening pages are very important, especially page one. Mm-hmm. The opening images, um, the inciting incident. The end of Act 1, which I say is page 17, page, then page 30, then page 45, then page 60, which is the tentpole of your movie, page 75, page 90, and then what is your finale? Those are the main beats that you need to get first before you fill in the rest of your beats. And, you know, both people go, well, how do I know what beat goes next? Well, I always say the best movies are good news followed by bad news, good news, followed by bad news. And, but they are increasing in intensity as the screenplay or movie progresses. So if there's a good news moment, there's going to be an equally powerful bad news moment. And then the next good news moment is going to be even more substantial. And the next bad news moment is going to be more substantial. And it has to adhere to the law of rising action. Okay. Because of the best movies, it grows in intensity. That's what keep, keeps us riveted, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then, once you have the the outline established, um, you know, character breakdowns. Now, with my character breakdowns, I like to do the protagonist and the antagonist, and it's in first person, and they're just kind of ranting. Okay, they're just kind of talking, and you're getting their personality, you're getting their vibe, and you're getting who this person is. Um, I know a lot of writers and a lot of actors, you know, what was their favorite color? What what ice cream did they have when they were three years old? That's cool if it works for your process. For me, that's not my process. I just kind of like to capture the voice of the character and the energy of the character. And um, then it's off to the races. And then you just start start filling in those gaps. Yeah. yeah. So the outline and, and similarly when I write, the outline is is everything to me. Like I have to have it's just, it's basically the foundation of the entire story. So without these points of like a guide, you're just lost, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I mean, everyone's process is different, but mm-hmm. for me, it makes it much easier because you're like, okay, I need to get to this point here. Okay, I just got to boom, boom, boom. This point here, boom, boom, boom. Here point. So having those key points is they're just kind of like mile markers on Absolutely. the journey. Structure is paramount. I mean, you're a professional. And this is another, another thing. New writers go, well, I, I, I want to be a writer or I hope to be a writer. No, you are a writer. Mm-hmm. And you're a professional writer when you start acting like a professional writer. And profe- prof- professional writers, they outline, they sculpt, they make this the blueprint on which they're going to create. And that's what structure is. It's, it's the canvas on which we paint with words. Mm-hmm. That's okay, great. So when- that was actually quite beautiful. 
<laughs> yeah, hug. So, so when the studio is going to hire you for a, an original piece, a spec script that you've written, or for a rewrite, they're hiring you for your expertise in this craft as much as they are hiring you for your abundance of creativity and execution. That's ex- yeah, absolutely. Now, let me ask you a, uh, the age old question. What yeah. is more important, plot or character? You know, you know. I mean, that's <laughs> a tough one to answer because I think it's it's a symbiotic relationship. It's mm-hmm. the balance. It's the yin, the yin and the yang. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's the space between the notes makes the music, right? It's just. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is. This is what we're all talking about. So I would never put more weight on one or the other. Mm -hmm. That being said, the best stories are about one thing. Okay. So you look at a commercial success like the movie Taken in -hmm. recent years. Yeah. Okay. That entire movie is about Liam Neeson doing what? Just – Killing and kicking everyone's ass along the but way. The whole- going, going to save his daughter. Right. His daughter has been kidnapped. Taken. Sorry. Taken, right. <laughs> kidnapped. So- horrible, horrible name. Taken. Much better. Yeah. So he just wants to get her back. So that is what the whole movie is about. Um, in Jaws, they need to kill the shark. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, the best movies, I believe, are about one pending question that needs to be answered by the end of the movie. So how, what would be the question for star Wars? You tell me, I would imagine it's the boy's journey to, God, I've seen that movie a million times and I'm a huge fan of it, but I, like, how can you, and it's probably the most, uh, the best example of the hero's journey uh, ever done to film. I, I, I can't say, I don't know. Like, isn't it about Luke's journey to find himself uh, and become a man? Eventually, his 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 journey from being a boy to being uh, a Jedi along the way and a path. And you know, f- oh God, you see, it's getting very convoluted here. <laughs> where, where where does he find his power? Within himself. There you go. That's okay. it. And, That's the story. Andy in Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption. You know, the Tim Robbins character. This is a man who felt imprisoned and only f- experienced freedom by going to jail <laughs> for a crime he didn't commit. Right. So he could have been, uh, you know, sans incar- incarcerated, so free of being incarcerated his whole life and ha- continued to do his accounting or banking but he would have never felt free unless he had that experience. That's very true. Yeah. So, um, it's always finding that one thing it's about. Yeah, it is. And there's a great line, uh, get busy living or get, get busy, busy dying. Uh, that pretty much oh. covers it. Doesn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's a, a great line in the movie and it, it basically is the movie, isn't it? Yeah, the whole movie is basically in that line, get busy living or get busy dying, and that explains that movie. So well, I talk about that movie constantly on the show uh, because it's, it's, just, it's it's one of my top five, you know, uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Now, um, you have uh, been, you've done, you've been busy, not only as a screenwriter, but as also as a teacher, uh, an instructor, and you've created uh, this awesome course called, called The Million Dollar Screenplay. How did you come up with the course and what was the purpose behind it? Yeah, so um, I taught at UCLA for over a decade, and I've spoken around the country at various events when they've invited me on the craft of screenwriting. And I thought, okay, well, a lot of people are always asking about the million-dollar screenwriter or the million-dollar screenplay. What is that all about? And it's not about selling the million-dollar screenplay and becoming a million-dollar screenwriter It's about having a body of material that's going to influence the masses positively through your art. 
So I thought, well, how can I communicate that in a course? And I thought, well, I, I'm going to teach the same thing I taught at UCLA in the undergraduate program and in the master's program. And structure is going to be a big part of it. And I'm going to hopefully put it in a, a form that's digestible to whoever wants to take the course. And it's not going to be you know, 25 uh, or 50 hours long, it's going to be two hours long, and they're going to get as much from it as if they were in a master's program in screenwriting. So it's um, a really condensed version of everything. So like, it's basically the log line of your course. <laughs> <laughs> Very condensed and right to the point. Well, that's right to the point. You know, I am super blessed, Alex. I have a daughter and she's amazing. Right. And someday she may want to become a screenwriter. So I thought to myself, well, if I were going to sit down with her and walk her through this craft and put her in the best possible position to succeed as a screenwriter, what would I teach her? And that's what the course is. That, well, I'm, I've already started taking the course. I haven't gone through the whole course just yet. I've started taking the course, and I was so blown away just by the beginning of the course that I, I reached out to you. I was like, oh, no, I got to get Paul on the show. I got to get Paul on the show. I got to I gotta spread the word. I got to spread the word. I drank, I drank, I drank the Kool-Aid, sir. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> and, you know, Udemy is a nice platform for education, and I'm, I'm proud to be on their site. Yeah, it's an awesome, it's an awesome, awesome course. Uh, and that's a great – It's a, I just discovered it myself, Udemy, and, and they are – uh, amazing. And, uh, and I'll make sure to everyone to have, uh, links in the show notes where you can get the, the course and stuff. Now, uh, on a side, a side question, um, I have a, a just cause I know you, you've been, we're probably around the same vintage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, there was a time where there was the rock and roll screenwriter. Um, arguably to say that Tarantino is probably the last rock and roll screenwriter. Uh, today but there was that moment that moment in time when there was the Shane Blanks Shane Blacks of the world mm-hmm. uh and the Joe Esther houses and they were making 2 million a pop 3 million a pop sometimes 5 million depending with back end or uh bonuses on yeah. screenplays um what are, are those days completely gone and how different is the the landscape the screenwriting landscape today mm-hmm. yeah well deals are structured in in all sorts of creative ways when you're dealing with agents and you know so you look at someone like an Aaron Sorkin okay and right I'm not gonna yeah I, I certainly like the Steve Jobs movie but I think Social Network was um it was a great movie mm-hmm. so if Aaron Sorkin got his quote so what I don't know what he's getting these days probably two three million dollars of screenplay mm-hmm but there's a chance maybe they said, hey, Aaron, can you take a million on this and get some back end points? I don't know if they did that deal. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. But that could be super lucrative um, mm-hmm. for a screenwriter. So when you look at just what's in you know, the trades of what a screenwriter made on a script sale, I wouldn't look at that. I would look at you know, the deal behind the deal. Right. And, and that's- then, Yeah. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, no, you go ahead. I want to hear what you think. No, I was, uh, to your point, to your point, I was actually watching a, uh, a documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, he's, he's, uh, you know, I've, I've studied Arnold's career for many, many years, a child of the eighties and stuff, but he was talking the business side of things. And he said, he asked, the, they asked him the question, which was the most lucrative film you've ever made? Um, they made the most money on. Do you, what do you think the answer is to that? I don't, I'm sure you know his whole filmography. What which movie do you think he made the most money on? That's a good question. I would imagine <laughs> Terminator. He had back end points um, when it got to the sequels. Today, to this date, mm-hmm. the most profitable film he ever did was Twins. Really? Did he get back end points? Or? He they structured a deal that yeah. was. It's kind of almost like the George Lucas. Oh, don't worry about the merchandising rights deal. Wow. Because yeah. him and Danny DeVito and uh, Reitman, Ivan Reitman, the director, they all walked in to – I think it was Universal. If I'm not mistaken, it was Universal or Fox. I forgot who it was. I think it was Universal who did it. And they walked in and they talked to the the president and like, look, we're all going to do it. We're all going to do it for like no money. We just want to – we just want like – and it was an insane amount of back end points, something mm. that no one has ever done before. But the studio was like, oh, great. If it's a hit, we'll make some money. If it's not a hit, we don't take 
you know, because Arnold was asking for 20 million at the time and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And he didn't say the number, but he says it's the most lucrative thing. So back end points and especially depending on the kind of deal you can make is, yeah, uh, it's very lucrative. I mean, look at, look at, I mean, Keanu Reeves on the Matrix movies, Jack Nicholson on the Batman movie, he pulled like 60 million off of that because he got a piece of the merchandising. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, it's the the gift that keeps giving. And, um, you know, that's where good representation comes into play because as a creative, I would encourage you to try to negotiate those deals yourself. (laughs) And even if you have the ability to negotiate those from your, you know, upbringing or past uh, life experiences, um, you know, it's better to keep you clean as the creative, I think. Right. Uh, It shelters you a little bit from the, the, the messiness that is the business. Yeah, so it, could, it could be, you know, involved. So, <laughs> and, then, and then you look at the guilds, right, Alex? So you mm-hmm. have the Directors Guild, the DGA, and then SAG, Screen Actors Guild, and the Writers Guild of America, WGA, and Producers Guild of America. Those guilds are set up to protect the creative person. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, you could look up, you know, the August Rush deal. I think it was in March of 2000 and go, wow, that was a big number. But it's really about... Uh, you know, the life of the movie afterwards. And there's no better time to be a, a creative person, a screenwriter, especially because just go to your local cable operator and see how many channels are on there. Oh God. And not even, let's not even talk about streaming, streaming and Netflix. And now Amazon's in the game and Hulu it, and YouTube. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's going to keep going and growing as it should. Mm hmm. And new forms uh, that are no longer new forms. Webisodes are fantastic. So now, do you suggest film? Do you suggest uh, screenwriters kind of also put their dip their toe? Like, I mean, uh, screenplays are you know for feature films is you know that's the the golden trophy, if you will. That's the, that's the thing that everybody's like, oh, I want to see my movie in the big screen. But it, it it's you might take a different route. Like now, like oh, maybe you could get something done on Hulu or on Amazon or Yahoo or. Things like that that might have very much more difficult times trying to get done more mainstream, but get your foot in the door, and now you have something to show. Do you suggest them stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think any avenue has a monopoly on how a writer should be produced and out to the world. And um, you know, again, don't be so precious with your work. I want to have an Oscar, so unless I get a studio deal, it's I'm not going to accept anything. No. Yeah. Get yourself out there. You know, this is all about, you know, sharing your gift with others. This is a short journey. I mean, I hate to say it, but a hundred years from now, most of us are not going to be here. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, I just read uh, Nikola Te- Tesla's books, actually. There's a few books on him. And after I read the first one, I kind of became addicted to his he's, story. He's amazing. Yeah. Amazing, amazing man. And this was a person who was like, yeah, let the Edisons of the world make crazy cash. I'm just going to keep creating and I'll be okay. And he was. Right. You know, and, that doesn't mean you should be frivolous and, and irresponsible with, you know. Well, he could have made, he could have made a couple of choices, just a couple of, you know, uh, patents. Just a couple. <laughs> he he <laughs> could have been doing a little bit better. He didn't have to have such a tough, tough time, but. Right, right. There's a ba- it's balance. It's all about balance. It's Edison's on one end, Tesla was on the other. You should be yeah. somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and Tesla had a few um a few patents as well that he did sell, but yes. you're right. You're absolutely right. And then you it's funny that that his name's Tesla and then they, they the new car company Tesla, you know, uh, followed uh, it was named after him. Right. And look at the amazing innovative things Tesla Motors is doing. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's you know? crazy. And I can't wait for, you know, the price to come down so I could afford one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um and one thing I wanted to say, uh I wanted to cover real quick cuz uh, you mentioned this earlier in the, in the in the podcast that with managers and agents and this is something I want to kind of stress to people. Like let's say you have let's you're starting out screenwriter and you have one screenplay and you have the opportunity to pitch Aaron Sorkin and let's say it's aligned with Aaron Sorkin you might not be re- Aaron Sorkin's agent you might not be ready to be thrown into that kind of world yet you might not have the the arsenal yet the experience yet to like be thrown into a writer's room because you haven't done it yet or you haven't had the experience you haven't written those 
you know, 20 screenplays or 10 screenplays. You haven't gotten, you haven't worked out your craft enough. Is that a fair statement to say or to be weary of that sometimes? I mean, obviously when an opportunity knocks, you know, yeah. take it, but you should be, should be cautious, uh, cautious about that kind of stuff, right? Well, let me, let me understand your question. So you're saying, just so I understand, that if you are given the opportunity to jump into the the big leagues, waters of the big leagues, you know, but you haven't, but you haven't, but you haven't done minors right. league, right? But you haven't done minors leagues yet, and they're like, all of a sudden, I'm in the I'm in the you know starting lineup of the Yankees, but I've swung the bat 15 times in my life. So is it smart to jump in there because you'll never get that shot again? Or is it? Do you see what I'm saying? Because I'll, I'll give you a real quick story. I was I was brought in after I did one of my movies. I was brought into some major agencies and major, um, you know, talent agencies and uh, you know, agents and managers. And I had a lot of meetings. And there was this one agent that I I had a meeting with, and he he was smelling me out. You know, he was trying to kind of figure out what I could do. And I I didn't come from the place of what I could do for him. I came from the place of what you can do for me. Mm-hmm. And and I was also realizing that I was just not ready yet. Like I was not ready yet. I, yeah, sure, I could direct the movie and I could do things, but if thrown into the into the into the deep end of the pool, would I have survived? I would have, I would have survived, but would I've thrived in that environment? So that's the kind of you know maybe I'm coming from a fearful place. I don't know. I would love to hear your point of view of like what you should do if something like that happens. And obviously, we've all heard story of people you know, like Robert Rodriguez who got the shot and he mm-hmm. flourished in doing what he does. Yeah. What do you feel? What's your, well, take on you it? know, my f- belief system is jump and the net will appear. And you look at somebody like Robert Rodriguez, who you just mentioned. So El Mariachi, he financed by becoming a personal lab rat where yes. they were doing pharmaceutical <laughs> experiments on him. I mean, this was a person who was, he's going to get it made no matter what he's driven. He was driven, <laughs> but he was driven not for fame or fortune. He was just wanted to express his creativity to the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say, okay, if you were going to give advice to Alex of yesteryear, mm-hmm. how would you have approached those precious uh, coveted meetings that you had differently? Um, well, the thing is I've gone through the path. I've gone through the um, – the game a few times, you know, with my first film, got a lot of attention. I got studio calls. I got that stuff. And then I wasn't ready. I didn't have a script, a screenplay ready. I didn't have any other projects ready and the heat was on me, but I didn't have anything else to show. So basically everyone was like, that's nice. You did this really great short film, but there was nothing left. You know, like I, I, and I, and I couldn't make it fast enough. And then by that time, the spotlight was gone on to the next guy and the rest is history. So then it happened again when I released my, my a few other projects of mine. And I've gone through this gambit a few times, mm-hmm. uh, never making it to the big, but I've had, you know, serious meetings with serious guys and, and, and people. Um, what I would say to the old, and this is like now turned into a, a session. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> um, what I would say to the Alex of yesteryear is, um, to not be so, not not be so eager to impress people with what you can do and your prowess mm-hmm. uh be but be more coming from a place of expression as an artist on this is on an artistic uh, the, the artistic point of view is become mm-hmm. show share your voice sure. and share your voice share who you are more than trying to be the next this or the next that and that's a mistake a lot of filmmakers make on the yeah. business side I would have done more research. I would have prepared myself better to go into these meetings, to go into the battle of these meetings in that sense. It was kind of like going in, you know, it's like going to a knife fight, going to a gunfight with a knife. You know, it's like how you brought your knife to a gunfight. It's yeah. similar, similar mentality. I was not ready yet. And also mentally, I wasn't there yet as well. So I think more homework would have mm-hmm. been my advice on the business side and more expression of who you are as an artist for better or worse if the people mm-hmm. like you or not and also not trying to please everybody because you will never please anybody everybody and that's something i've learned doing indie film hustle and being online is you can't please everybody you you know sure. my point of view is not going to be everyone's point of view and that's okay i mean there's certain people who look at howard stern who's made hundreds of millions of dollars on his point of view 
whether right. you agree with him or not. You know, yeah. it's it's yeah. you know, some people think he's a pig, some people think he's awesome. Right. But it's just the point of view. And that's all you can really do as an artist is express yourself as who you are. And that's the people who I think become successful in whatever avenue they go down. Yeah, excellent point. And yeah, you know, and that's a very honest assessment of where you were at the time and what you would have done differently because you, you have to be, you know, a little bit brave to really take a hard look at yourself and who you are and who you were and who you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, of course, all want to be a, the best version of ourselves, right? Right, right? Yeah, but that being said, I think you could have made that relationship successful yes. with the right approach and spirit, mm-hmm. which you identified. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of key things you've said during this chat, which I think is interesting. You said in one of your stories, you said, you're never going to get this opportunity again. Right. Well, that's how a lot of people think. Of course you are. You know, what is this one shot or nothing mm-hmm. thing? I mean, you know, you'll never work in this town again. <laughs> it's over. You know, it's, you know, if you wrote, you know, Schindler's List, and is an agent going to go, "Oh no, you you pissed me off two years ago. I'm not going to." No, it's a masterpiece, so they're going to get it made. Yeah. Um. So I I think let your material do the talking for you, and don't talk yourself out of a deal, which a lot of writers do. They get very excited. And they don't know when to go, okay, I'm just going to shut up and let the experts talk and do my job. Right. And I'm talking to myself as well, by the way. When I give that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel you. I feel you on that one. No question and, about it. And then Alex, one thing you said also, which before I forget, I'm going to mention is going into battle. Mm-hmm. Well, I would change your, your, uh, your inner voice. What battle? There's no battle. This is beautiful. This is going to be a lovely waltz. And it's going to be an under the moonlight waltz with uh, Mr. or Mrs. Agent. And by the end of it, you know, we're going to part ways and they're going to be feeling great and a little bit uh, wealthier than before. And I'm going to feel great and get to do my craft at a high level. How beautiful. Now I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm going to, say something here because I love what we're doing here. It's it's wonderful and I'm actually getting a lot out of it personally so I really appreciate it. But what I think is that a lot of filmmakers, screenwriters, artists in general um, and, and you know, I've been around this business for a long time and I've been in the trenches most of that career. I've I've dabbled in, you know, I've gotten, I've worked on projects. I've got Sundance. I've worked with Oscar winners. I've worked with people, you know, a different project. My projects have never gotten to that level uh, yet. But what I've noticed is, and there's something I'm working on as an artist as well, and that's what Indie Film Hustle is kind of teaching me, is that I have a lot of armor on. And I have a lot of like, like you said, that battle terminology. When my inner, my inner voice, my inner spirit is not that kind of guy. But being beaten up by the business for so many years in different avenues of the business, whether it be in post-production where I come from or screenwriting or filmmaking – um, or anywhere, artists generally will just throw this armor on and then it's, that armor starts getting heavier and heavier and heavier to the point where you can't move and you can't even do anything. Mm-hmm. Where someone like you just said, you know, it's a, it's a waltz. It's a flow. When you think of a waltz, what do you think? You don't think of anything heavy. You think of something very flowing, very smooth, very just, you know, just kind of going with the flow. And I think a lot of artists, as the years go by, become more and more disgruntled uh, in a lot of ways. I, I'm that person as well. I have yeah. been, and I've been kind of trying to get myself out of it. And just hearing you analyze my terminology has shined a light. I'm like, man, he's absolutely right. It's not a battle. And mm-hmm. if you walk into a, a meeting like that as a battle, then it's going to be a battle. Um, but if you walk into a meeting like that with a much more open energy and just like, hey, this is the way it's going to go. And if it's for you, great. If it's not, there's another opportunity down the street. Um, and that's the, that's something I wanted to kind of say to everybody listening that, you know, this business does beat you up uh, a lot. And I'm sure, Paul, you, you can att- attest to this. I mean, it, it is a brutal business in many ways, uh, but it doesn't have to be. And you can kind of make things flow 
for you. And I think a lot of people who are working at the highest levels aren't these kind of bulldogs. Sometimes they are, <laughs> but well, a lot of times they're not. And it depends who you're dealing with and sure. what your what circles have you created. Okay. Yeah. That you have and and getting <laughs> getting beaten up. Well, who wants to be in that industry? Going to battle trenches. These are all war terminology. <laughs> You're absolutely so, right. So who wants that? So it, as a new writer, I would encourage you to do this exercise. Write list of adjectives of what you think the entertainment industry is, and if your adjectives include brutal, <laughs> pretentious, um, fake. And, and the list goes on and on and on, then I would encourage you to rethink and revamp that entire list. The entertainment industry, my list is they're creative, they're generous. Uh, we influence the masses positively. There's this wonderful thing we do, which we get people out of their daily routine and we put them in the moment to where they don't have to think about yesterday or tomorrow. They're right there in the moment. And there's residual value for people who read our screenplays and watch our movies. They can go back to their life and be, if their life is beautiful or chaotic, tumultuous uh, or joyous, they're going to come back with something of value to contribute to the loved ones in their life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the holidays, right? Thanksgiving, what is Thanksgiving? It's giving thanks, right? Mm -hmm. What is collaboration? It's co-laboring. Mm -hmm. So start appreciating because when you appreciate, things increase in value. When a house depreciates, it loses value. Mm -hmm. When it appreciates, it increases in value. So if you get in the habit of appreciating things in your life, even the little you know, kicks in the shin every now and again, and just appreciate it. Wow, what did that teach me? I mean, I look at the entertainment industry and, you know, have I had my challenges along the way? Sure. If you're in, you know, a, a career for a decade or two decades, you're going to have those times when you go, ow, that really hurt. That was painful. That hurt my feelings. This was emotionally trying. And you have to look at it and go, okay, well, that's true. And then you have to ask yourself, what did I do to invite that into my life? And then once you own that, okay, what have I gotten from this? It wasn't a lost experience. How can I use this for future endeavors? You know, if I meet an unsavory person in the entertainment industry, even at a high level meeting, mm -hmm. I instantly recognize and I think to myself, oh, huh, how can I? help this person? How can I contribute to them? How can today be the day when this person will no longer be unsavory because of the energy I'm bringing to this dynamic? And how can we create something of value? And that is, that is the key, I think, with everything we do in life is to be able to create value for people. And, and I think one of the reasons why this podcast and, the, and, and Indie Film Hustle has been so well received is I wholeheartedly am trying to create value. And I've I'm kind of an experiment for that. I, I'm an experiment for that because I'm at the, at the core of what I'm trying to do with, with this is to help people. Cause I was just tired of seeing so many filmmakers walk through my, my doors in post-production mm -hmm. and just get, you know, and, and I, I don't want to use this bad negative terminology, but, <laughs> eaten, but eaten alive by yeah. the business in a lot of ways with their beautiful m m films. And they don't know how to market themselves. They don't know how to promote themselves. They don't think about the long term. that all this kind of stuff. I was like, you know what? Let me see if I can shine some light and help some people along the way so they don't have to go through the the pains yeah. that I went through or that yeah, I've seen. You're doing a great job, Alex, and it's really beautiful and altruistic what you're doing for writers and creatives, not just screenwriters, but anyone could you know, value from what you're doing, and I think it's awesome. I'm trying. Um, <laughs> and you look at someone like – so right now I'm in a deal with Shirley MacLaine, Oscar winner. I've, mm -hmm. I've done copious projects with Shirley. Mm -hmm. And Shirley is a person, if you look at her career, she's been working for, what, over yeah. 55 years or something? She worked on, uh, on uh, among other movies, but one I love is the Alfred Hitchcock movie, uh, Family Plot. If I'm not mistaken, she was in that one, right? Um, so, no, no. 
Three. That was it? the one. That was the one. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. That yes, was yes. her first movie. Yeah, yeah. That was her first movie. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What a and, first movie that was. <laughs> right, exactly. And she got, you know, she was on Broadway and take, I think Hitchcock was in the, in the audience and saw her. But so Shirley's had this career and everyone goes, oh, what a lovely, beautiful career she's had. It's just like sculpted out of magic, right? But you look at her career, there were times when she gave her belief systems about metaphysics, quantum right. physics, mm-hmm. um, past lives, aliens, that were, her beliefs were not in alignment with mainstream media and the mainstream thought processes. Correct. Um, people wouldn't even allow that type of thinking in their realm. And you know, people really responded harshly towards her and what she was doing, mm-hmm. and she could care less. She traveled. She did more movies. She did Broadway. She did Vegas. She sang. She danced. She wrote books. I think she has seven New York Times bestsellers. And Shirley MacLaine was and is a purpose who's on a a person who's on purpose, not paycheck. And as a result, those uh, situations never even hurt her. And she just kept going. She went, huh? Interesting. Bam. Kept going. Okay, so. You, Alex, are now at a point where from your experiences, mm-hmm. you can look back on that tumult that you experienced and go, huh, now I have a different perspective. I can look at it through a different lens. Mm-hmm. Your listeners who have not yet jumped into to the deep waters of the entertainment industry can look at their life now and ask themselves, what journey do I want to have in the entertainment industry. And I would encourage all of us to not write our Oscar speech (laughs) just yet, (laughs) but to write our lifetime achievement speech. Oh, that's great. That's really great. At age 90, when you're up on stage and your friends and family and kids and grandkids and everyone's up there, what body of work did you contribute to this world? And that's a question you should ask yourself. What do you want to contribute to this world? Not what you can take from this world or from this business for that matter. Exactly. Well, I will ask um, uh, just a couple questions I ask of all of my guests. Well, first of all, Paul, this has been an eye-opening and enlightening uh, interview. I have taken as much as uh, as you're giving, I've taken as much as hopefully the audience will take out of this too. So it's it's been eye-opening for me. So I really appreciate your amazing Thanks. energy, man. I really do. Thanks, buddy. Um, it's, it's been uh, very beneficial for me as well. And I'm um, really a big fan of what you're doing. All right. So two, the, the last two questions I always ask all my, all my, uh, my guests, what is the most underrated film you've ever watched? <laughs> okay. Is, are you asking a two part question or should uh, I answer that one? You should. And the second part is what are your top three films of all time? So okay. go ahead. Okay. So, you know, there's a movie called Colia. It was a foreign film. Um, I believe it's K O L Y A. Okay. And uh, I believe it was Czechoslovakian. Um, and it was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, just brought me to my knees. So that would be one that I think most people don't know about. Okay. And the next question was my top three. Yeah, and that could be the top three that you can come up with today. Because <laughs> yeah, that always fluctuates depending on the room and the time yeah. you're in. Yeah. You know, there's so many great movies, not only in our wonderful country, but other countries as well. Mm-hmm. So there's a Chinese movie called Farewell to My Concubine. Oh, I'm yeah. not sure if you ever saw oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, um, oh, yeah, a while ago. That, yeah, was, was, that was during my video store days. Yeah, <laughs> there's a Brazilian movie called Central Station. Uh huh. I've heard um, of that one. That was a good film. Yeah, the same producer who did City of God, Donald Ranvo, did Central Station. He's City great. of God is amazing too. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and then you know, look at look at the, the young filmmakers of today that are just coming out with such interesting uh, material and just you know breaking all rules and boundaries. Um, Paul, I'm a big fan of Paul Thomas Anderson. I think he's really mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. You know, Wes Anderson's great. Um, you know, then you have, uh, you know, the females, uh, Audrey Wells is one of the great female writer directors that I think is underrated and has not shown us her best work yet. Although most of her work has been extraordinary. Mm-hmm. 
uh, Allison Anders. And so I, I look at the person, even Francis Ford Coppola, I had the good fortune of sitting down with Francis uh, in class at UCLA. There was oh. eight of us. Yeah. Oh my God, that must have been a heck of a day. Oh, it was like three hours with Francis Ford Coppola. It's like, what? Just, and, and, and you're just talking talk shop? Yeah, he's just talking shop. And uh, it, this was you know, a long time ago, but sure. he, he was such a, a, a creative yeah. You know, he, he came in very stalwart and, you know, the uh, you know, the legendary director. But then once we asked him about, hey, what are you working on? He turned into a little kid. Mm-hmm. And that's – those are the best creative people, right? I mean, we're all just splashing in the baby pool and playing in the sandbox and finger painting, really. That's a – yeah, I have twin daughters, so I, I – and they're in that, era, in that age now. So I, I, yeah. I, I feel you. I feel you. It's fascinating well, watching them. Grow well. How old are they? Uh, they're going to be four in a couple days. In a few weeks. Oh my yeah. god! What yeah. a beautiful age, right? Yeah, they're just. It's every day is something new, and <laughs> and I'm introducing them to like uh, you know different. Like they know who the Hulk is. Mm-hmm. They know who Yoda is. Like it's so fun. <laughs> so like when anywhere we're in anywhere in the world, they'll like they'll point at Yoda or the Hulk like on some advertising. Like that eats your Hulk. It's it. <laughs> so it's and that's starting to introduce the you know introduce them to story. But I'm yeah. seeing what story kind of resonate with them obviously frozen is the greatest movie of all time <laughs> oh my god if i hear that song one more time <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Don't uh, worry, alex just let it go I, they, oh, I that, oh it was rough so that, that was a rough one uh, but so, yeah it's beautiful but that's great man and you know your daughters you have a responsibility to, to them you know what is responsibility responding with ability and um you know walt disney you know uh Bambi, you know, he saw yeah. how kids reacted and realized from that point on, this is a real responsibility I must take seriously. Right. Cause yeah, Bambi was, I, and a lot of, I don't know about you, but uh, you have a daughter who holds your daughter now? Six. Six. So, yes. she, so she's a little bit she's a little bit ahead of us. Um, the, the Disney movies, the old stuff. Harsh. I, I right? can't, I can't, I, I can't show them Pinocchio. Like, I know. it's like there's, one, I mean, they're turning into yeah. donkeys, they're drinking, they're smoking, <laughs> there's, there's abduction, there's like, it's like craziness. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it makes the Grimm movie, the Grimm stories like seem tame. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. It's some of the, it's like Snow White's way too harsh. Like I can't, like I, even the book. Like I got them the book and they get scared by the imagery of the book. I'm like, uh, and I'm uh, like, I can't, I can't. So I'm stuck in more with the Pixar stuff. And even then some stuff I, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. hesitant about, but yeah, it is a responsibility. No question. Isn't it great, man? Don't you love being a father? It's wonderful, man. It really <laughs> is. I know this, this whole interview is too, just all of a sudden just turned into two dads talking. Uh, <laughs> well, Paul, I, I really, man, I, I can't, uh, well, let me, one last question, one last uh, piece of advice. If yeah. you have one thing to, one piece of advice you can give screenwriters just starting out, what would it be? Right. Right, right, right. And just just enjoy the process. Don't be so hard on yourself. As artists, we feel so deeply. So we get hurt and our feelings hurt and we beat ourselves up and, you know, give yourself a break, okay? Um, the way that you handled things in the past does not have to be the future. Right. Okay? Start reacting differently and be kinder and gentler with yourself, create and continue to write on. On that note, Paul, thank you again so much. It's been an amazing, uh, amazing interview, amazing podcast. So thank you so much for your time, sir. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot. And uh, to be continued. I hope you enjoyed going inside the mind of Paul Castro. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash ISM010. And if you like the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you listen to the show. Head over to screenwritersmind.com. Thank you for listening. And as always, write, rewrite, sell, repeat. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind with Alex Ferrari at ScreenwritersMind.com. And for more great filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com.